यथा निर्दयी का शक्ति राम कृष्ण स्थिता ही यंग सर्व विद्या स्वरूपम तम सर्वदाम प्रणमम हम I bow down to Sri Sharada Devi, the spiritual consort of Sri Ramakrishna. As fire cannot be separated from its burning power, so Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother Sharada Devi are the same entity of pure consciousness, manifested in two forms. To bestow grace to humanity, open shanti, 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 peace, 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 be all. Friends, we are very lucky that we have a guest speaker this evening, Prabhajika Birajaprana, a senior nun of. Vedanta Convent in San Francisco. She has spoke several other times in our place. She has an. She was on her way to Chicago. There is a big gathering, so she is going to speak there this weekend. So on the way, she stopped at Saint Louis, and we requested her to give a talk, and she agreed. Our topic tonight: Holy Mother's amazing grace. Good evening to you all. It's very nice to be back in St. Louis and to spend time with my brothers and all of you. Ramakrishna Gata Pranam, Tanama Shravana Priyam, Dhad Bhava Randa, Dhad Bhava Randa Thakaram. Vishwamatra Swarupinim, whose soul is dedicated to Sri Ramakrishna, who is fond of hearing his name, the embodiment of his thoughts, and who is the mother of the universe. I'd like to start this evening's talk with a story, and it's a personal story, so please don't mind. It's not personal about me, but it's about something that I witnessed, and I'd like to share it with you all. In 2003, my father unexpectedly passed away, and at that time, my mother seemed she seemed to be fine. I went back to San Francisco, and within a few weeks, I got a phone call. From a relative who told me my mother was diagnosed with a fatal cancer, and she was not going to live long. So I went to pay my last respects to her, and I took a small photograph of Holy Mother. And when I took the picture out of my bag, my mother said to me, "Oh, she's she's on your altar. She's in your chapel." She met in San Francisco. She recognized her. I said, "Yes, that's true. She is." Now keep in mind that my mother was a very devout Catholic, and she was devoted to Mother Mary, the Blessed Virgin. She had a statue of the Blessed Virgin on her dresser next to her bed, and I told her, "You know, Sarda Devi is the same being." As the Virgin Mary, it's just her form is different. If you pray to her, she'll answer your prayers. And with that, I put the picture of Mother next to the Blessed Virgin. Okay, so then fast forward, maybe eight months later, <coughs> she only had a few days to live. So again, I went to see her, and when I went into her room, I said, "Oh." Where is Sarda Devi? I didn't see her on the dresser. And she opened her eyes and she said, "I saw a light when you said her name." And I was I was dumbfounded.、And、then she said, "She's in the other room." So I went to the living room, 
She had a small table there, and on that table she had a series of saints. She had St. Francis of Assisi and St. Anthony of Padua and the Blessed Virgin, and there was Holy Mother there with all of her friends. So I took Holy Mother's picture into her room, and I placed her above so that she could see her from her bed. Now, she died like maybe a day or two later, and she was in terrible pain. When I put that picture there, she opened her eyes, and she got this unbelievable, beneficent look on her face, and she said, she's smiling at me. And I thought, Mother's grace is truly amazing. There was some communication between my mother and the Holy Mother. What it was, I'll never know. But toward the end of her life, um, she had this wonderful smile on her face as she was looking at the Holy Mother. It made me think, and I thought <clears throat> it's really difficult to understand how the Divine Mother embodies herself in a human form to satisfy our needs. She supports us, she protects us, she transforms us, but it's an undeniable fact, and that's grace. The embodiment of Divine Mother in a human form. You know, grace, as Swami was saying, it's not easy to define. It's not a philosophical concept. It's not an idea. Grace is an undeserved blessing. It's conferred on us regardless of our merit or our fitness. It's freely given. It's something that we experience deep within. Now, as all of you know, you know, the Holy Mother was born as a very simple woman in a remote village in Jarambati, in the middle of the 19th century. She was extremely shy and retiring away from the public gaze. So how to imagine that such a self-effacing, shy woman was actually the Divine Mother of the universe, ready to bestow her grace on one and all? It's difficult to understand, really, in the 21st century. And not just now. It was difficult even during her times for those who live with her to recognize who she was. Mother's silent life and her influence is really a mysterious play of human and divine. I mean, she lived her whole life veiled physically, but not just physically, also spiritually. Her divine nature was veiled by her humanity. But for all intents and purposes, Mother was human in, in all respects. And that's how she could relate to us in her human form. Swami Sardinanda once remarked that Holy Mother led a very unassuming, commonplace life, hiding her spiritual sta status as though she were in disguise. Well, I would say it's not as though she were in disguise. She was in disguise. You know, Sri Ramakrishna used to say that his divinity was concealed. And he would give an example of a band of minstrels who suddenly appear in a village and they dance and they sing and they return and nobody recognizes them. When Holy Mother came and went with Sri Ramakrishna's minstrels and nobody recognized her either. She was so modest and so adept at concealing her divinity that even Sri Ramakrishna's monastic disciples, who were spiritual giants themselves, didn't recognize her. Swami Vivekananda wrote a letter in 1894 to his brother disciples addressed to Swami Shivananda when he was in this country. He was praising Shakti and the need for it in the world that was in the desperate straits. 
He said, you have not understood the wonderful significance of mother's life, none of you, but gradually you will know. And gradually they did know. And further, when we consider mother's life after the passing of Sri Ramakrishna, how she lived in Karmaprakur, in utter poverty and neglect, it's really heartbreaking. And her relatives, Sri Ramakrishna's relatives, they ignored her, they deserted her, and Ramlal, Sri Ramakrishna's nephew, even discontinued the small stipend that she was getting from the Kali temple. And yet she bestowed her grace on all of them unstintingly. Sri Ramakrishna used to say that mother was the embodiment of Mother Saraswati, <clears throat> born to bring knowledge to people. But she wasn't born just to bring spiritual knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, in the highest sense. She brought all kinds of knowledge, including, in her own subtle way, knowledge of ourselves, our personalities, our shortcomings, our limitations, so that we could become aware of them and overcome them. She was also Sarada, the giver of wisdom. Sri Ramakrishna considered her as the primordial power, energy of the universe. In the Shakta Tantras, there is this idea of the Dasha Mahavidyas, these 10 supreme powers enumerated as the 10 wisdom goddesses such as Kali or Tara, Tri Purasundari, Bhuvaneshwari. Only Mother is considered as one of these manifestations of the wisdom goddesses. And as we know, Sri Ramakrishna worshipped her as Shodashi. And Shodashi is one of these wisdom goddesses who's endowed with the 16 supernatural or super cosmic powers. And she's especially gentle, calm, and compassionate. You know, once Sri Ramakrishna alluding to mother's divinity, he cautioned his nephew Hridoy. Hridoy used to speak to mother very rudely at times. And he basically said to him, look, you can insult me if he who dwells here, meaning inside himself, hisses. You can probably somehow manage. But don't hurt her feelings. If he who dwells within her hisses, no one, not even Brahma, Vishnu, or Shiva can protect you. Sri Ramakrishna also considered mother as Kali, the same as the deity in the temple. And once a devotee actually said to mother, mother, I, uh, people say that you are Bhagavati. And Mother said, it doesn't matter what other people say. I tell you myself, I am Bhagavati. Now to me, these are significant incidents because it's what Sri Ramakrishna said about Mother and what she herself said about herself. So we really can't get any better firsthand authentic account than that. There are a number of incidents in Mother's life where she revealed her divinity, but they were rare. She's also bukti mukti pradayani. She's one who fulfills all of our needs, secular as well as spiritual. According to Swami Ashokananda, one of the Swamis that was in charge of the San Francisco Center, he used to say that there is a universal mother heart that exists in the center of the universe. It pulsates in the center of the universe and it resonates within the heart of every being. So I think we can say that mother being the embodiment of this universal mother heart, she could touch the heart of everyone who came to her. One of the best ways I feel of trying to understand the mystery of divine grace and how it works is to reflect on mother's life. 
I mean, in our ordinary experience, we're not particularly familiar with how divine grace works or what comes as a result of divine grace. Everything that we're familiar with in this world, all of our relationships with others, is dependent upon something. This is a world of cause and effect. So we're not familiar with something that doesn't fall within that category. That's the structure of the relative world. And further, in our spiritual life, <clears throat> there's so many conditions are given. There's the adhikara vada, for example. Well, you have to discriminate. You have to be dispassionate. You should develop the six treasures. You should have intense desire for moksha, etc. Sometimes it seems, well, almost impossible that we can fulfill all of those requirements. And yet Mother's grace pours over us like a soothing balm when she says, now that you are with your mother, what's the need of so much japa and meditation? I indeed am doing everything for you. Now eat and live merrily, free from all fear. There are three Sanskrit words that I particularly like in our scriptures that are appealing in the attempt to describe the qualities of divine grace. One of them is ahetuka, which means something that has no cause or motive. It's absolutely motiveless. The second one is prasada, something that's extremely gracious. It's propitious. It's like receiving an unexpected gift. And the third is anukraha, which means it's unconditional, absolutely without any condition. So these three words we can often find in our scriptures as uh, describing grace. Now our late Swami Prabhutananda in San Francisco defined grace like this. Swami said grace is that power which the seeker feels as unconditioned, bountiful, and benevolent, coming in various ways and helping at every step. That subtle, beneficent power, it nourishes and sustains us. And as the Swami said, it is overflowing, helping at every step, which I take to mean it's active in our daily lives. You know, Swami Vivekananda wrote a hymn on Sri Ramakrishna, and there he describes him as Shakti Samudra Samutta Tarangam, as this mighty wave in an ocean of power. We need power. We need energy to make headway in our spiritual lives, which is expressed beautifully in a prayer, O Josi, O Jo, my Dehi, Te Josi, Te Jo, my Dehi. Give me this strength, give me this power, give me this energy. You know, fuel is necessary for the maintenance of our body, to run our cars, to heat our homes, to heat our food. In our spiritual journey, our human effort alone is not enough. We need super plus fuel, and that is grace. It's not a biofuel. Whatever is necessary for us, for our spiritual growth, grace will provide that. It's a boost. It elevates us, raises our consciousness. It may or may not come in a form that we think we need or that we wish, but according to our spiritual masters, when grace is conferred, the result is unfailing. Sri Shankaracharya says in the Viveka Chudamani, there are good souls, calm and magnanimous, <coughs> who do good to the others as the spring, and who having themselves crossed this dreadful ocean of mundane existence, help others also to cross the same without any motive whatsoever. 
And the Sanskrit word that Shankara uses as a he to non, no cause whatsoever. You know, in inspired talk, Swamiji says of such persons that they give as the rose gives perfume because it's in its own nature. As Swamiji says, utterly unconscious of giving. So our Holy Mother was an extraordinary embodiment of this magnanimity. She showered her grace on everyone without the least calculation and she was completely unaware that she was doing it. As Swamiji said, utterly unconscious of giving. It was so natural to her. There were no special qualifications required for Mother's Grace. She's a heituka. No questions asked, no bio data needed, no resume, no confessions. Her grace is beyond bargaining it's beyond questions. You know, Sri Ramakrishna was very strict. He tested his devotees in various ways before he accepted them as disciples. Mother never did so. Is it ever possible for a mother to test her children before she accepts them? Can a real mother reject a child because it's wayward or it's weak or it's naughty? and only accept the good ones? She said, suppose a child falls down and gets dirty. I alone have to pick him or her up, clean the child, and take him on my lap. That's a statement from meditation. That's what mother does. She cleans us. She cleans our minds and our hearts. Holy Mother was prasada. She was gracious, the personification of kindness and tenderness. She had equal love for everyone, for robbers and saints and sinners and ordinary people, struggling spiritual aspirants and demanding quarrelsome relatives. The only condition, if we may call it so, to receive her grace is to call her mother. That's the only condition. That's the only self-effort required, according to her. The divine expresses itself in infinite ways, but a kindly, gentle mother plus divinity, it's a rare combination. She openly said that Sri Ramakrishna had left her behind to demonstrate the motherhood of God. And when we talk about the motherhood of God, what we mean is that God is so labhya, which means he's accessible. God becomes accessible to us as a living response of reality through the natural relationship between a mother and a child. That's grace. How many were able to interact with Sri Ramakrishna as they did with mother? How many were able to take advantage of Sri Ramakrishna's company as they freely did with mother? For one thing, Sri Ramakrishna was almost always lost in higher planes of consciousness, frequently unaware of the external world. But mother, through her tremendous control and her amazing grace, was always fully present, though her spiritual state was equally high. Holy Mother's compassion was unconditioned. It was anukraha. While dealing with all kinds of people, she was non-judgmental and always forgiving. All of these innate qualities manifested in her naturally, just like breathing. She didn't have to make an effort, effortless. And as the Divine Mother, she was aware that she herself exists in all beings in men and women, in plants, animals, birds, everything had emerged from her cosmic form. She was aware of that. 
When the Devi Mahatma and the Chandi, we know, Ya Devi Sarvabhuteshu Matra Rupena Samstita. She who abides in all beings as mother. You know, a young disciple of hers, Rashbihari Maharaj, who later became Swami Arupananda, several of the monks of that generation came to her when they were really young boys, maybe 11 years old or something. And this Rashbihari Maharaj, there are, there are many conversations, he used to ask her all kinds of questions. He was very innocent and he would ask her whatever came into his mind. And one time he said to her, are you the mother of all? And she said, yes, I am. And he said, even of these lowly creatures? Yes, there's two. And there was another brahmachari named Gyan. Gyan was a little impatient, and he used to treat Radhu, her niece, her cat, very roughly at times. And mother would caution him. And when that cat had kittens, mother said to him, don't beat the cats know for certain that I dwell in them too. I do not know anyone, she said, for whom I do not feel compassion, not even an insect. Now, Mother rarely spoke, and she never said anything just for effect. Who but the mother heart of the universe can make such an all-inclusive statement? Mother always encouraged others to address her and to interact with her as they would their own mothers. She avoided any excessive display of divinity. She didn't want to create the least separation or for her disciples or devotees to feel that they weren't intimate with her. She wanted them to feel completely natural to her. Through her grace, this is how she subtly connected a person with a divine. Once she told Girish Ghosh, Sri Ramakrishna's bohemian devotee, when he had asked her, what kind of a mother are you? And she said, you're a real mother, not just the wife of your guru, not an adopted mother, not a vague mother, not a stepmother, but your real mother. Some of the monks had lost their mothers when they were very young. And they had been deprived of the affection and the love that mothers give their children. And later they reported that they actually saw and felt the love of their mothers in Holy Mother. She had quietly filled the void in their hearts. Mother sent one such monk on an errand, and this monk had never known his mother. She had died before he was born. So she said to him, she was sending something to a person, and she said, please tell this gentleman that mother, and she emphasized the word mother, has sent this. And the monk said, she said, repeat it. I will tell him that she has sent this. So mother repeated it. Tell him mother has sent this. Second time he said, I will tell him she has sent this. So this went back and forth a few times, and finally he said, I will tell him that mother has sent this. This is grace. Mother understood and sympathized with everyone. Her grace knew no bounds. Her helping hand extended to all, regardless of the need, spoken or silent, she lifted everyone by accepting them just as they were. As they were, so she accepted. Everyone found a home with her. Mother did not have any homeless children. She was the mother of all without any barrier or condition. Now Swami just gave the example that Sri Krishna used to say, the breeze of grace is always blowing, just unfurl your sail. Well, that's true, and it sounds simple enough, but sometimes it's a struggle to get the sail up. But Mother seems to say, don't worry, you don't have to unfurl the sail, I'll do it for you. One night, an attendant found Mother doing japa late in the night. 
And she said, Mother, your health is not so good. Why, why are you doing all of the spiritual practice at night? And Mother said, you see so many people come and they take the mantra and they go back and they don't practice anything. I am doing it for them. Mother had a delicate knack of dealing with people and their problems, unlike us. She was fully aware that there's no ideal situation in life within a family, work, human relationships, a monastery, wherever. There's always some difficulty or some problem. And she felt deeply for others, and she sympathized with people's struggle. We all make mistakes. Who hasn't? But mother comes and she says, never mind, don't worry. Everything will be fine. And she also excuses us not only that, she defends us when we are overcome by our human weaknesses. I mean, how to describe her mercy? She's porna. She's full of loving grace. Another example. There was a Swami, his name was Mahadevananda. He was coming from Kowalpara to Jarambati and he was bringing a load of vegetables and various supplies for Mother, carrying them in a big basket on his head. And Mother hadn't specified that he shouldn't hire a porter, so he told the merchant, it's okay, you'd, I don't need a porter, I'll take them myself. But the problem was, it was the rainy season, and so the roads were very muddy and slippery. And as this Swami was struggling, and the day passed into evening, he started to wonder, my God, how am I ever going to make it? And then suddenly he realized that the load on his head didn't have any weight anymore. It was completely weightless. And when he got to Jairambati, there was Mother pacing, very agitated, back and forth on her veranda, talking to herself. Why didn't he hire a porter? Why didn't he hire a porter? She's saying to herself. And the Swami realized that it was Mother herself who had re relieved him of this heavy load. Similarly, her grace lifts a huge heavy load from our heads as well. When Mother interacted with recalcitrant individuals, such as Radhu, her niece, and her crazy mother, Suravala, she never rejected them, she never condemned them, she never complained about them or anyone else. But she was always generous and impartial, even when her patience was tried to its ultimate limits. There's so many examples that can be cited from her household days and affairs to illustrate mother's superhuman endurance. From raw to forcefully throwing an eggplant at her and hurting her, to Surabala insisting that mother had drugged Radu with opium to keep her under her control. And at one point was about to strike mother on the head with a piece of firewood. But unbelievably, mother took the dust from her feet and sprinkled it on Radu's head and begged the master to forgive her. And as far as Surabala was concerned, she forgave her and overlooked her insane and obnoxious behavior again and again. If this isn't supreme grace, what is? You know, once Swami Premananda, one of Sri Ramakrishna's disciples, said, all sorts of people used to come <clears throat> to Balor Mutt for initiation, this and that. Some of them maybe were not a very good character. And he said, we couldn't take it. So all of these people, we would, we would send them to mother. He said, if we had taken them on, we would have been burnt to ashes. Mother could absorb everything. And further, there is the striking example of Amzad, the rough Muslim dacoit, whom all the villagers were afraid of, and the saintly, gentle, Swami Sharadananda, both of whom she considered equally her sons. They were the same to her. Can we even conceive of this? It's inconceivable. 
and conversing with Amzad one time when he hadn't been around for a while, he revealed that he, he was absent because he was in jail because he had stole a cow and mother completely ignored what he had said and went on with the conversation as, she, as if she hadn't heard it. And later she said to one of her attendants there, my child, several among those who come here are up to anything in life. No type of sin has been left undone by them. But when they come here and they address me as mother, I forget everything and they get more than they deserve. To get more than one deserves is grace. Again, I am the mother of the wicked. I'm also the mother of the virtuous. Never fear. Whenever you're in distress, just remember, I have a mother. Now, to me, this is really astonishing. It's not just an empty assurance, but it's a mother bestowing her grace equally on those who were good and virtuous, as well as those who were mean and immoral. That's really amazing. Many people still feel mother's grace from all walks of life. We simply have to remember that we have a mother. That's all that's required. You know, once she accepted some fruit for offering from the master from a thief, and her attendant noticed this and was horrified, and she vehemently objected to it, and Holy Mother scolded her. She said, I know who is good and who is bad. That was the end of the conversation. Another time a cook whom Swamiji had sent out from Balor Mutt because he had stolen something, he, he took refuge in Mother. And she sympathetically fed him. And when Swami Premananda came to visit her, she said, take him back. He stole something because he's very poor. And of course, Premananda was trembling because when Swamiji was annoyed, everybody stayed away from him. And as they were approaching the ground, Swamiji noticed Swami Premananda bringing the cook back. And he said to those there, see this Babaram? See this rascal? He's, he's bringing this person back. And Swami Premananda said, told him what Mother had said. Swamiji instantly calmed down. He accepted Mother's word. He remained quiet and never said anything else. You know, those who were rejected by society, they always found a place with Mother. Just as Jesus said, come all you are, who are heavily laden and I will give you rest. Mother seems to say, all of you come to me anytime, day or night, under any circumstance. You're my own. I will never reject you. A young girl came to Utboden one evening and she was crying, and she wanted to speak to the Holy Mother. They spoke for some time, and after a while, Mother went out in the middle of the night with this girl to her hut. Some of the Swamis noticed this, and they followed at a distance to make sure she was all right. Mother went into that hut, and very soon it became very quiet. And after some time, the crying stopped, and mother came out. She silently came out. She never said a word to anyone about what had happened. No one ever knew what had transpired within that hut at the dead of night. Swami Keshavananda was the head of the Kowalpara ashrama. He was a little hot-headed. And the junior monks, they often, they didn't get along and they would go and they would stay with Mother or they would stay with Swami Saradananda. So this Swami went to Mother and he complained. And he wanted her to send these monks back to him. He felt in this way he could control them. When Mother heard this, she flared up. And she said, I am their mother. How dare you to ask me to speak to the monks in that way? Wherever my children go, the master will look after them. I can never ask anyone ever not to come to me. 
Her grace flowed like a river swollen after the monsoon over that troubled young girl and the Swami who had realized his grave mistake. Another mark of mother's grace is the bestowal of fearlessness. We never know what's going to happen to us in this very unpredictable world. But mother rushes to assure us, remember this always, that there is one behind you who will come at the right moment. With this reassurance, mother removes all of our fear, especially the ultimate fear and uncertainty, the fear of death. She's always there standing beside us, smiling at us. To someone struggling to control his thoughts, she remarked, it is the nature of water to flow downwards, but the sun's rays lifted up towards the sky. Likewise, it is the very nature of the mind to go to lower things, to objects of enjoyment, but the grace of God can make such minds go to higher things. And that is exactly what she did through her grace. She directed the minds of those who came to her Godward. She lifted them up. It's simply unimaginable the lengths she went to in order to fulfill the ordinary needs of each and every person from washing their bedding and quietly remaking their beds, to going from door to door in the village to get milk for the devotee's morning tea. Silently, unnoticed, she labored day and night for the good and comfort of others. One woman devotee reminisced, she used to cook herself and feed everybody. She even cleaned the leftover plates of her children despite protests. Along with her relatives and lady devotees, she used to do all sorts of household chores. Though limping through arthritis, it did not stop her from fetching water from the pond. She tolerated the curlish and rude behavior of her relatives. I was amazed to see the extent of her patience, her tolerance, and her humility. You know, Mother never talked much. What she was, she just lived in her daily life. No one was a stranger to her. None felt insecure with her. There was no fear when with her. She never calculated or wished to gain anything from anyone. And above all, she didn't have any kind of a special personal love or attachment for anyone. Her love and her mercy and her kindness were all inclusive. You know, when a young disciple, Bharata, purchased some coarse cloth for the girls that live with her instead of fine British cloth, the girls objected. They wanted the fine cloth. He didn't want to buy it because he was a freedom fighter. And mother said to Bharata, the, they, the British, they're my children too. I can't afford to be partial. What is really remarkable is that everyone who came to her felt special. They all felt her grace. Each person felt that mother loved him or her the most. Mother demonstrated that love is not divisible. It's limitless. She had this infinite love for everyone. So her affection for one person wasn't diminished by her affection for another. She gave to each person whatever that person needed to fulfill every heart completely. She even defied Sri Ramakrishna on several occasions. When the young boys were coming to Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother would feed them nicely in the evenings, giving them several chapatis. When Sri Ramakrishna noticed this, he told her that eating so much would spoil their spiritual practices. Well, that was too much for her. And she responded that they were young boys, and one or two extra pieces of bread wouldn't make any difference 
he didn't have to worry about how much they were eating. And furthermore, she would take care of their spiritual practices. Sri Ramakrishna withdrew, smiling. On one occasion, a woman expressed her wish to carry the master's food. And later, he objected to Holy Mother that her character was not good and she shouldn't be allowed to do so. And Mother replied to Sri Ramakrishna that she could not make that promise of not allowing someone to do this small service for him. She said, when someone calls me mother, I cannot deny anything to them. They are also your children. Why do you deny them the opportunity to serve you? I cannot do that. Mother had that love and power to bestow divine grace which comes directly from the source. God is love. And when that love manifests through a mother's heart, no one has the power to resist it, not even Sri Krishna. So in conclusion, as we began, mother's name sheds light, illuminating our minds and our hearts. And she's always there before us, gently smiling, <coughs> encouraging, and blessing us. So let us all offer our prayer to Mother for her grace, along with Swami Abedananda. Kripam Kuru Mahadevi Suteshu Pranateshu Cha Charana Shraya Dhanena Kripa Mayi Namos Dute. Bestow your grace, O Mother Divine, on your children who have taken refuge in you, and give us shelter at your feet. O oh, compassionate one, salutations to you. Thank you. Thank you, Vidya Prana, <clears throat> for that very inspiring and beautiful talk on Holy Mother's grace. <clears throat> when she was talking, I was thinking a couple of incidents about Mother's grace. Swami Parameshwarananda, a disciple of the mother who was the head of Jarambachi for many years, I knew him from 1962. One day, Holy Mother told him, My son, she was initiated by, he was initiated by Holy Mother. You go to Belun Mart and take your monastic vow from Brahmananda. He sent her, she sent her, she sent him. Why? Go. She who went and to Shalinas came back. The Swami later mentioned, the mother told him, Tumar mrittu yog chilo, you are supposed to die. Taking this monastic vow, you have a new life. It is her grace that her, his disciples' life was saved. That is called grace. Grace. Swami, Ramakrishna Nandaji was dying from tuberculosis in Udbodhan. Mother was in Jai Rambachi. He wanted to see mother once more. Mother says, I cannot come to Calcutta because my house, she is staying and there is no place. Mother did not come. But before his death, mother appeared before him and gave him vision. That is called grace. Mother's punishment is also grace. Her reward also is grace. She knows what is good for her children. We are all her children. 
Sometimes when we suffer, then all those things, you do not know. She is destroying your karma quickly. I think we heard one story that one of your disciples was going to a wrong direction. So somebody told Shami Sarudananda, Maharaj, he took initiation from mother and looks he is going to astray, going to wrong. Sarudananda said, who are you to judge? Mother is taking him perhaps very quickly, more than you. But that path may be a thorny path. Mother taking him quickly, giving him all these problems and sufferings and all these wrong things. She is finishing her karma, his karma quickly. Who are you to judge? She knows what she is doing for her children. We have to listen all these stories of the mother. Amazing. You know, ordinary village woman, somebody thinks, think, well, she's just a woman. But Sri Ramakrishna knew that who she was. Sometimes that reader, Sri Ramakrishna's nephew, was very jealous of her, her and did not treat him her well. That Sri Ramakrishna cautioned him, look, if you say anything to me, you may get by. But if she is angry, even Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva will not be able to protect you. She is Divine Mother herself. Anyhow, I am glad that Viraja Prana came and shared some of her thoughts on the Mother with us. I knew her from 1972. 52 years I know her. Quite a long time. She and Ananta Prana, they're like my own sisters, you know. They went from Kentucky, joined in San Francisco. Little girl, now she's an old lady. <laughs> <laughs> I have some wonderful sisters in the Hollywood and Santa Barbara and San Francisco. Nice people. She sometimes she edits my things. She is a good writer, editor. She knows a lot of work. Very hard worker. Midwest people. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I'm glad that all of you came tonight. Jai Ma.